book, My Life is a Telephone. <clears throat> you know, Bashar once said that in that context that then he was using E.T. and T. to call here. <clears throat> I think it was really a mistake teaching them our humor. <clears throat> Say good day to you this day of your time. How are you all? All right, thank you very much. Before we begin with new information, let us continue the transmission with regard to questions on clarifications of yesterday's material. You may proceed. Yes, good morning, Michelle. And to you, good day. Changing thoughts, changing feelings, yeah. changing beliefs. Yes. yes. And the foundation of beliefs. I wonder if you have any suggestions as to techniques for doing that. It seems to be it's a very mental thing for me. And by the way, I love being around you because you make my brain sweat. However. Oh, all right. <laughs> and, to, and today. Do I'm you need to call a doctor? <laughs> I'm having a lot of heart opening uh, All today, right. and, and my question So your heart is, is sweating, too? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> Why not? What I is wrong with heart sweat? Heart sweat is wonderful, but I don't think I want to work so hard to make it work. Oh, all right. You don't have to work too hard. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so the question is, yes. are, are there any uh, specific <clears throat> techniques that would connect from the mind to the heart, to the feelings, to that inner knowingness, to make the changes in those uh, uh, deceptive, deceptive foundational uh, beliefs that are the untruth. Yes, well, it all hinges on the facility that all of you possess that you call imagination. This is what your imagination is really brilliant at. That is making that connection, making that bridge. <clears throat> when you use your imagination, when you fully use it, it's not just a mental act. It is that which gets you in touch with what is in your heart of hearts. When you envision, when you imagine in that sense fully, when you picture, when you dream, when you allow yourself to unfold the image within you that is most representative of your excitement, of your joy, of the reality that you prefer, you will allow yourself to begin as you create and crystallize that image fully, you'll begin to feel your relationship to it. And as you feel your relationship to it, you will be blending the idea of your mind and your heart and your spirit, you follow me, and your body. Yes, yes. Imagination is the crucible in which all these other facilities and all these other vibrations can be melted together, blended together, and reformed into a new understanding of who and what you prefer to be as a person experiencing physical reality. Does Could this that, make some sense to you, yes, first of all? Uh, it, it does. And um, could, could that be linked also to making a declaration, declaring and decreeing that my word is so? Yes. And again, and the, my yes. And again, 
the idea is to allow your imagination to be your guide because your imagination is specifically keyed to coming up with methodologies and tools that are specifically shall we say aligned to your vibration in other words your imagination is designed to come up with what techniques will work best for you specifically that's what your imagination is for you understand yes so when you say is there a specific technique well yes but there are many techniques each individual will have a tool or a technique that will work best for him or her <clears throat> so even though there are some fundamental principles as we have shared them with you your own imagination is your best guide for taking those fundamental tools those fundamental principles we've already shared and putting them together in a kit in an order in a methodology that works specifically best for you so you must rely both on the information that you discover through your own synchronicities through us through any other avenue what have you but you must then blend that put all that information within your imagination and allow your imagination to put them in the proper order and use them in the proper way that's best for you in that sense you are amplifying them in that way by using your imagination with them by using them in your imagination does that make sense yes indeed is that sufficient to answer your question or is there some other specific way in which you wish to explore this concept before we go on no that's fine thank you so much you are so welcome Sure. And to you, good day. I would like a clarification on interactions that you have on a daily basis with people um, that, say, are negative, are uh, depressing, are in some way not positive to be around. Well, all right. My Were you present when we delivered some of that information yesterday? Yes, I was, and so that led to my question. I, my what I usually do is just try to avoid these people. I don't find pleasure being around them, oh, right. and so I avoid them. But yesterday I got the impression that we might actually grow faster our... You can, yes. If we are around them. You can, yes, and that is a purpose that they can positively serve. The idea, of course, is in some senses twofold. Number one, as you say, not so much a matter of avoidance, <clears throat> But a recognition that if someone is of a vibrational frequency that simply isn't compatible with your preferential reality, then yes, you do not necessarily have to associate with those people. Then that's all well and good. And then in that context, you're also giving them, by behavioral example, an opportunity to understand a consequence of their action. In other words, if they want to interact with you, they will also have to change their frequency for you to want to interact with them. Mm -hmm. If they choose not to, then there will be no interaction, and that will be seen as a consequence of the vibration that they are choosing and the vibration that you are choosing. So in that sense, you can recognize that you may not have compatibility and you don't have to associate, but you don't have to look at it as avoidance per se, mm -hmm. because the idea is, is that if you simply are of a certain frequency, it will probably be less likely that you will simply allow for an arrangement to occur where you will encounter them as often or even at all <clears throat> however on the other side of that coin as you say in your language if you then with that understanding still do encounter someone of that vibration then yes you have exactly exactly and precisely understood that it can be used still nevertheless in a positive way to accelerate your own growth to enhance your own growth and also perhaps still yet as an opportunity or a possibility for them to learn something as well by seeing how you respond to them you fall okay I, I understand that then they would see how I would respond but yes. what benefit am I getting around being people that are depressed and negative well you could help them perhaps alleviate their depression only if they're receptive to it of course but again it doesn't matter because it still can be used by you in a positive way. Use your imagination on this. Mm -hmm. And again, remember, simply and fundamentally, there is no mystery to the idea that you might keep running into people like this just because you're on Earth, and that's the way Earth is right well, now. It, it is. And, and, and So it is not an issue of attempting to avoid that. In other words, ultimately, there really is, at this moment in your evolution, no way to completely avoid that 
because you have made an agreement to recognize that there are still going to be a number of people going through their own processes, probably still exhibiting a lot of negativity, and so on and so forth. And you simply have to allow yourself to recognize that's the atmosphere in which you exist right now. And it will eventually change. But not right now. Right now, you are still capable of running into many different kinds of people with many different kinds of beliefs, many different kinds of attitudes, some of which are going to be highly incompatible with yours. But you have to trust the synchronicity of your life in that if they are there in your life, if they do come in to your life, then there is something there that will help either you, them, or both of you, if you are willing to look at it from that perspective. Because again, you see, if you really are of a vibration that you say is the vibration of your preferred reality, then it won't matter to you who it is that comes into your life or who it is you interact with, because the interaction for you will always be positive, beneficial, and constructive, and allow you, perhaps, to exercise more compassion. You follow? Yes. It, it seems like as I think that I'm getting to be more positive, yes. I'm actually running into more negative people. But you see, then that's a good sign. It means but, you can handle it. Don't you get it? Remember when we said the idea is that growth on your planet at this time is not an exclusion principle, it's an inclusion principle. And the more light you create in your life, the more you will become aware of the dark that also exists in your reality. Becoming aware, more aware of more of the dark, means you are containing and radiating more of the light. So it's a good sign. Except there's more and more people I don't want to be around. But you see, you're judging it. And in yeah. judging it, you are matching their frequency, and that's why it's uncomfortable for you. Okay. It's uncomfortable not because you are actually staying in your frequency. It's uncomfortable because you're not staying in your frequency of preference. Okay. That's then, for you, obviously, one of the main reasons why you're attracting them, to show yourself that it's actually very easy for you to succumb to their vibration instead of staying in the one you prefer. And therefore, this is actually a constructive lesson for you, that it's easy for you to give up the reality of your preference in light of what they are offering you instead. And you don't have to. So I would know that I have made a change when I'm around these people and I recognize that they're being negative or they're depressing and yes. I just don't respond to it in any way. You respond to it in a positive way. But that it doesn't means, affect you in that sense. It's correct. That doesn't affect in a negative you in any way. way. That's what I meant. Negatively, that it yes. Doesn't affect you. you can remain neutral with it if it does occur. I mean, you can also make your own statements mm -hmm. in a loving way. You can make a statement to a person to say, your energy in that sense is not really compatible with the preference of how I wish to experience my reality. Now, I'm willing to assist you as far as it goes. But you also have to recognize that you have the opportunity to change your energy. And if you choose not to, I will love you nonetheless because I allow you to choose whatever it is you believe is best for your reality. But I will have to simply let you know that a consequence of your choice might be that we may not interact any longer because I prefer not to have that energy in my reality. So you give them a choice. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, you put it on equal footing. At the same time, again, if they do keep coming into your life, it's still your opportunity to recognize that you don't have to give up the vibration of your preference just because they happen to be there. Otherwise, they are still simply giving you a chance to recognize that it's easy for you to give up your preference. Okay. Does that help you? Yes. Um, I also had a question about that you said that we're on the threshold of, of change. and. Well, uh, of course. You're going through it rapidly. But it seems like... There's still a lot of violence, and, yes. and yes. Uh, you read the paper, and it doesn't yes. seem like there's a big change. And All right, once audience. again, once again, once again, please, please, pay attention. The closer you get to the light, the more darkness will appear. Okay. Did I not just say that a moment ago? Yes. Well, then why would it be surprising to you that you will see more violence coming out? The idea, once again, is that as you close in on the threshold, you are giving yourself an opportunity to get all of the old stuff out of your system. But in order to get it out of your system, you have to get it out on the table in front of your face first. 
You have to see what's going on so that you can see that you can make a difference and make a change. But in order to make that change, you have to know what it is you are changing. And to know what it is you are changing, you have to see more of what it is you've been hiding under the table. So the closer you get to the light, the more capable you are of allowing the darkness that has been suppressed to come to the surface. So, of course, there will appear to be at first more negativity, more violence. You're getting it all up out in the open so that you can really finally, finally see what the choices are, dark and light, and allow yourself to choose the reality you really prefer. But that's a symptom of growth. It's a symptom of change that everything will be there, not just one side. Everything has to be there before the change can really sink in. Does like that make sense to you? Yes. All right. It seems you like say that with some resignation. It's okay. Uh, here's a resignation. <laughs> Why isn't that it exciting seems, to seems... you? Why are you not defining that? as exciting, knowing that that's a symptom that you're getting closer to crossing that threshold instead of looking at it as if somehow there's something wrong. Because I, I hear what you're saying and I, and I believe it on a global basis, but on an everyday basis when you talk to, to people you work with or people that you meet yes. and they're just struggling to get by, they're not, they're not yes. even asking questions much as looking for answers. So, so there's not a... I don't see a lot of growth. So, in, I, I mean, I, not everyone on your planet will change. But the you majority know. are not. Not everyone on your planet will change, and it may not even be the majority that will. That is not going to stop the idea of a transition. If in your mind you require a majority to go into the light in order for the entire world to change, perhaps you just don't understand the physics. The idea is this, positive energy is integrative and geometrically powerful in that direction. Negative energy is segregative and in that sense it requires fewer people going in the positive to outweigh the amount of people staying in the negative. This is the idea behind the phrase that exists in your society of the 144,000. It means many other things as well. But the point is, is that if you actually have only 144,000 individuals vibrating above a certain frequency level on your planet in a positive energy format, those 144,000 will actually energetically outweigh the other several billion who may be still in negativity because the several billion in negativity are not functioning cohesively. Okay. Whereas the 144,000 are functioning geometrically cohesively. So in that sense, their energy completely outweighs the other billion individuals who are not functioning cohesively. I see that. Does that help you understand the process? Yes. Then take heart. All right? Remember that as you shift and as you change, bit by bit, day by day, literally into new realities every moment, ultimately, yes, you will only ultimately, not right now, ultimately see only those operating on the same level with you. But the population of the world may not be the same in that new reality. Do you understand? Does that help you? Yes. All right, thank you. Thank you. And to you, good day. Um, I wanted to ask for some clarification about the power of illusion versus the illusion of power. Oh, all right. And how that affects. One moment. Okay. This is something that was discussed for those of you who were not participating in the first part of the transmission yesterday. The idea that one of the strongest focal points that you can get to in life is to understand that it all comes down to discerning the difference between whether or not a person, yourself included, is operating under either the illusion of power or operating from the power of the illusion. Go ahead. Okay. I was thinking about this a lot yesterday and how it applies in the struggles that I'm facing. Oh, all right, the struggles well, you are facing. <laughs> I was trying to... Um, 
So in other words, you're already into the yeah. idea of the illusion of power. Just by defining them as struggles. But I understand what you mean. I don't want to take your pain away from you if you want to hold on to it. Okay. I think I've been... Um, I know how much your pain means to some of you. I know how dear it is to most of you. And I know it's an old friend you don't want to say goodbye to. So by all means, continue. Yes, I know. That's why I'm having some fun with you. Those policemen say that that's an old friend. Yes. Um, but I look at the power of illusion. Yes. The power of the illusion. The illusion that we're disconnected. Yes. If you understand it as an illusion, then you are empowered. If you think it's real, you are suffering under the illusion of power. Okay. Now, it's a real experience. The experience you're having is real, but the reality is an illusion. Okay, I get that. Oh, all right. Then how would you like to apply what it is you are getting to what it is you are not getting? I'm not getting how... how oh, I, I'm sort of thinking a lot about my daily, my daily life and what I feel about my daily life. All right, what do you feel? your daily life? Well, I, I feel like, I think that I'm in the illusion of power, thinking that if I can control these certain elements in my yes. daily life, then yes. that will give me power. And what do you mean by control them? Well, if, if I could just get to those things that are weighing on my mind. Such as, know, for example? Uh, just the daily things. The just the daily things, the such things, as? Cleaning out the closet. Yes. Okay. Well, where's the hesitation in doing that if it's something you actually want to do? There's a lot of resistance. Because? Because I'm holding on to that struggle. Because of how you're defining the idea of cleaning out your closet. How are you defining it that you would resist it? It's a chore and something taking away from time that I could... Yes, and why are you defining it that way if it's something you say you want to do? Did I ask a good question? Yeah. All right. Cleaning out your closet. Let me ask you another question. <clears throat> if the closet were cleaned out, how would you feel? Better. Well, then why don't you clean it out? Because I'm used to not feeling good. You're used to not used feeling to good. I have this resistance. So you like not feeling good. I, I don't. But you I don't? don't? Yeah. Are you sure? You sound like you like it. You sound like you really enjoy not feeling good. Yeah. Now, you have a sense, an inkling, as you say, that you could feel good and that it might feel good to feel good, but you're not sure mm -hmm. that it would feel as good to feel good as it feels to not feel good. That's exactly right. Well, where does that belief come from? Um, if you know that cleaning out the closet would feel really good, it would feel, what, freeing? Mm -hmm. I would feel happier when I walk in my house. You would feel happier when you walk in your house? Then here is another question for you. And this is a question for all of you. And it gets to the heart of some of the difficulties you have. Why is the act having been done not the same as the doing of the act? Why do you make a separation and a distinction and a difference between those two ideas? Why do you make it two ideas? The act of doing is the act done. The energy is the same. Another way of saying this is that the end is the means. The means are the end. There is no such thing as the idea of justifying the end and the means being different. Whatever the means are is the end. It's one and the same. The illusion of power that you're falling into is that these are two separate things. 
the cleaning of the closet and the closet already being cleaned, you are creating that to look like two separate things. It's the same thing. The act is the act done. The joy of having it be cleaned can be the joy of cleaning it if you see no separation. We have done a little bit of an analogy with people from time to time to illustrate this point a little bit more strongly and help anchor it into your body consciousness a little bit more fully. Do you have a coin? Will someone provide a coin? Now, will you please do us a favor and put the coin down on the floor? <clears throat> Did you do that? Yeah. All right. Are you standing up now? Okay. Is the coin on the floor? Yeah. All right. Now, will you pick up the coin? Did you? Yeah. Was there an effort involved? No. Why not? Very well, what's the difference then between that and what you're talking about? What's the difference? It is that simple. The doing of a thing that you want to do is immediately done. When you associate with that thing the energy through the entire act. You follow me? Maybe you should assume that your closet is full of coin. <laughs> and that picking them all up will make you very rich at the end. Okay. This is how... You can use your imagination to use what does work for you in an area that doesn't seem to work for you. So turn your clutter into coins okay. using your imagination and feel the same degree of richness, freedom, and abundance you would feel if you were in fact picking up dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of coins. You follow me? This is one way you can use your imagination in this way. Oh, that's great. Is this helping you to unlock this assumption that the doing of a thing is not the same thing as the thing done? Yeah, it, does. it is all one thing. It is all one thing. The reason that many of you create difficulty in this area of your lives is because you have been taught to be goal-oriented. The doing of the thing itself is the reason for the thing, not the end result. In fact, there actually never is an end result, ever. Because your life, in that sense, goes on. Your existence goes on. There is no end result, ever. Because you will never reach the end. Ever. Did I mention ever? So while you can certainly envision an idea, and while you can certainly manifest it in a process that seems to have steps that might ultimately result in a certain kind of a manifestation, stop looking at that as an end result or a goal. The only goal you have is to be yourself as fully as you can. It is the only goal all of you have. It's the same goal. You all have the same purpose, the same mission in life, to live your life as fully as you can. So define it in the way you prefer to, and live that way in the moment, every moment, because this moment is the only moment there is. Always. It's always now, isn't it? No matter when you look, it's always now, isn't it? It may be a different perspective of now, but it's always the same now, because there is only one now. Only one. And everything you consider to be a different moment is actually the same now looked at from a different perspective, a different point of view. That's all it is. So that's why they say, be here now. It's actually because that's the only place you can be. But when you pretend by falling under the illusion of power that you can actually be somewhere else, you focus on the idea of the future, the goal, out there, someday, to achieve, then you are not focused where you actually exist. And thus then, 
you find that in paradoxically falling under the illusion of power, thinking you're controlling your reality by reaching out toward a goal in that way and detaching yourself from the present, you actually paradoxically give up all the power in the present you actually have. Because you're not in it anymore. Because the present is the only point of power there is. Because it's the only place you exist. So when you try to control by achieving a goal out there someday in the future, you leave all your power behind in the present, where it waits patiently for you to come back, so that you actually can be in control. This is the paradox of surrender. When you talk about the idea of surrendering, you're not actually giving up control, you're giving up the illusion of control. And surrendering to the power you actually have, which allows your life to automatically and effortlessly work in every moment, because in every moment there is joy being in that moment, no matter what it is that needs doing in that moment, is filled with the same joy because it's being done in that moment, in that energy. And no separation is being made between the act doing and the act done. Is all of this helping you? Thank you. Then thank you. Thank you for the present. You are welcome. For thank you for unwrapping your present. <laughs> Bashar. Yes. Good day. Well, it's what I just described. The idea is that the concept of surrender is the concept of recognizing that all you're actually giving up is the illusion of control. The idea is that when you understand it is an illusion, then there's nothing out there to manipulate. <clears throat> the idea of falling under the illusion of power is the idea that you have to control your outer reality to make things happen. The idea of falling back into the power of the illusion is in recognizing it is an illusion and there's nothing there to manipulate, you fall back into your true power, which is the cessation of trying to manipulate. Does that make sense? Yes. So when you know it's an illusion, why would you manipulate it? It's like trying to take your shadow on the ground and stretch it into another shape instead of just moving your body to change the shape. You see, again, the analogy of the shadow, the analogy of the reflection in the mirror is that the point of power is here with you and not out there in the mirror, not over there in the shadow. If you want the shadow to change its shape, if you want the reflection to smile instead of frown, you don't go to the mirror and try to make the reflection smile. You don't go to the shadow and try to make it change its shape. You smile or you change your shape. The mirror reflection must then change. The shadow must then change. That's when you are understanding the power of the illusion instead of the illusion of power. Make sense? So you basically redefine the situation so yes. that you can smile. Yes. And then you're using the power of the illusion. Yes. Because it all comes from you first. Nothing in the illusion can happen without it coming from you first. This is the third law of creation. What you put out is what you get back. But if you think that what's out there is how you change what's in here, then you're working it backwards. I'm not saying you cannot use the outer reality as an incentive to allow yourself to feel capable of making the change. But then you're using the reality as a proper tool. But if you assume that somehow the outer reality has control over whether or not you change, then you are falling into the illusion of power instead of using the power of the illusion. Using the power of the illusion means you can recognize reality as an illusion, but you can recognize it as an effective reflection. And you can train yourself by creating or changing, making changes in the outer reality that are reflective of what you know inside you truly are. And if you understand that it is simply a reflection, then it can be a powerful tool. 
But if you think the power is actually out there in that reality and that you can't change without it, then you're succumbing once again to the illusion instead of the power. Make sense? Absolutely. Does that help? Yes, it does very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Are there any more clarifications before we move forward with information? Yes, there are. <clears throat> All right. Um, I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more or clarify a little more the <clears throat> subject of the oversoul. We were talking about that just before we ended yesterday. Yes. And the question I wanted to ask was, is there an ultimate mission or trajectory of of an oversoul, a process with a, 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 a goal um, or a, a... The oversoul is not exactly goal-oriented. Well, okay. It's experientially oriented. Yes, but is there, is there again, a sense of, of purpose, as we might define purpose to the experience? In other words, what I'm wondering... Well, is, loosely, perhaps. You could define it as purpose, maybe. Well, what I was thinking of it... Uh, more specifically was when we have the appearance of of a, of a great teacher or yes. an avatar such as Christ or Buddha or, yes. or someone like that. Yes. Does this represent um, a process of integration yes. of an oversoul where the various parts of it have have yes have really flourished and, and expressed as much divinity yes. as is individually possible within those yes. parts so that yes. they then are yes. absorbed yes. into one. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. And the idea of what you typically on your planet refer to as Christ consciousness, Buddha nature, Krishna spirit, is actually the oversoul of oversouls. In other words, it's the oversoul of the collection of oversouls that make up all the individuals on your planet. It's the oversoul of Earth itself and all the consciousness associated with it. That's the level you're talking about when you refer to that level. It's an oversoul of oversouls. Does that make sense? Yeah, very, very much so. Um, another, another question I had kind of on the same topic was, I have um, assumed, in a sense, that part of the deal... The deal? But the deal, yeah. I mean, I, I look at it in terms of a deal. Oh, between, all right. Say the creator. Did you read the fine print? <laughs> well, yeah, this is important. Yes. <laughs> um, the deal... Yes. ...between <clears throat> the creator consciousness that, that, that manifests worlds and universes and... Individuals, yes. people, yes. <clears throat> and the the individuals that that are experiencing this process yes. is that every so often this appear this kind of manifestation will occur to remind us yes. of what we're ultimately capable of that it is part of the process of physical manifestation of all worlds. right well is that's that one way to look at it but. You have to understand that the way you have phrased it is quite symbolic and not necessarily interpretable on other levels in the same way. It's not so much a deal as it is simply a natural result of the nature of all that is. Well, the periodic visitation, as it were. Of well, such let me put it to you to another way. A reminder. Well, yes and no. Let me put it to you another way. <clears throat> all that is is aware of the fact that such manifestations can serve as a reminder is completely aware of the ability of that manifestation to function that way and obviously then there is reason for such a manifestation to exist within all that is that serves that purpose <clears throat> but from the viewpoint of all that is it is more like unto the understanding that <clears throat> it is a natural result of the way in which all that is sees itself. It's more like the idea of the deal that all that is has with itself, to be itself, in all the ways that it can, 
So in being itself in all the ways it imagines that it can, then that's one of the ways that are possible within all that is to be. Therefore, it must be one of the things that happens. It's not like it made a specific deal to make sure that would happen at specific times or anything of that nature. It simply is one of the ways all that is can be, and so it is. Well, there's a passage in the Bhagavad Gita where yes. Krishna is saying to Arjuna that any time that the balance of light and darkness or positivity and negativity in yes. the world, good and evil, when that balance threatens to be overthrown by, by the darkness, yes. that, it, that is the moment in which this kind of I see. A manifestation... What you are referring to simply is that the existence of all that is has a built-in self-regulating mechanism, and this is true. In other words, the way we have often phrased it is, in actual fact, if you wish to look at the totality of creation, it's actually slightly biased toward the positive. And what I mean by this is this. There is what you classically understand to be the positive side, the negative side. But then there is also a point in the center that is neutral, yes? Well, the idea of finding yourself in a neutral place still gives you the opportunity to choose which side you wish to go to, which way you want to go. And therefore, even the idea of neutrality is itself slightly positive. So you could actually say that in essence, the universe is actually 51% positive and 49% negative. Therefore, the self-regulating mechanism is that it will always in a sense, churn itself directionally back toward the positive in whatever manifestations need to occur to represent that current that exists within the matrix of existence itself. Does that make sense? Yes, and, but how does this fit into the concept of the yugas, you know, the, 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 those periods that we look at, at historically where there is a... It's simply a physiological translation of the idea that there are cyclic currents within existence that often represent themselves over and over again in a variety of ways. But that's simply the nature of all that is. That is the nature of all that is expressing itself in whatever dimensional domain it can express itself in, in whatever way is relevant to that dimensional domain. In other domains, it expresses itself quite differently other than in what you recognize as periodicity. Periodicity is simply the way that is translating that particular essence or nature of all that is into a space-time framework. Does that make sense? Yes. Does that help? Very much. Thank you. Thank you. Any other clarifications required? Hello. And you, good day. Well, I really just wanted to share a bit of uh, humorous synchronicity, if you will. Oh, all right. <laughs> Is it relevant to what we have been discussing? Yes. All right. Um, yesterday, you may recall, I, when I sat down, I addressed you as Bazaar. Yes. Of Bashar. Yes. <laughs> And last night when I was uh, back in my room flipping through the TV channels, I came across an episode of Cops, something I don't normally watch. Cops. But, yes. All right. And so when they, as they were going to commercial, this particular one said, the title said, Cops, Bizarre Calls. Yes. <laughs> so I... That so you had a very me. bizarre day yesterday. A very bizarre day, very much. All and, right. Uh, I'm having a fabulous time, and I just wanted to share that with you, and thank you very much. Well, thank you all of this fabulous information that is... Uh, Thank you for generating your own great. synchronicities as well. <laughs> Thank you, Bashar. Sure. I got it right that time. <laughs> and you got it left. <laughs> One more. All right. Hey, Bashar. Sure. Uh, and a you good day. Good day. Uh, yesterday we were talking about um, beliefs and emotions. And, yes. And then a separate subject of motivation. Yes. And on the way here um, this morning, and actually also yesterday morning, as I was driving to get here, and April was expecting me, and I was running late, and the faster I'd try to go, the later I, was, I would get, and I was getting angry. So the more you ran, the more you stayed in the same place. But not only that, oh, yes, right. not only that, um, the anger that came up, because I was trying so hard, and I didn't yes. really disappoint her, and yes. the anger that came up was 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 compelling me in a sense 
the anchor was 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 in in control and drivers were I was cussing at drivers all right how exciting okay all this stuff so maybe for you for not for them so you don't know that for a fact but go on well yeah you're right but this morning it was it was very interesting because after taking that information in from yesterday yes I went okay where did I choose oh you mean you paused I did oh thank you I paused thank you and thank you for reminding me that I paused yes I paused and I went okay where did I choose to operate in this manner where did I choose to go into this anchor and I asked myself the question and then maybe five minutes later what came up was that when I was when I was in the womb I had a twin and the twin died and it was an extremely traumatic experience that I've done a lot of work with a lot of layers there all right and I what I got in touch with was my choice as she was dying and I was sure that I was going to go with her all right that I decided and made a strong strong choice and I hope I don't cry here because you can cry if you wish I made a strong choice to get really really anger to to call angry to call forth all the anger that I could in myself to stay alive all right and to that and there was this thought in myself if I can feel the anger I'm still alive therefore from moment to moment I can in a sense push myself forward and be alive very creative yeah it was creative except except now you're getting tired of it exactly so because I think by now you've probably caught on to the fact that you're alive yeah but here's the question as as she made she and me made made that decision yes and and is directly motivated is is directly around the motivation for moving forward in life as well and I've noticed the pattern very deeply ingrained in myself all right very good and so I as I realized that I went god that's where my determination is so strong in life is 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 from her in that choice and I thanked her for propelling you for forward in life for and and for save in a sense who knows maybe she saved my life you were both a classic example of a physics experiment for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction so for her going back into spirit it pushed you that much harder forward into physical reality ah interesting two eternally connected particles spinning off in two directions always connected no matter how far apart because space and time are an illusion so you are exhibiting the idea of quantum connectedness with your twin oh wow that clears up a lot on that now here's here's my here's the fun this is here's the question yes that was a very strong decision with a lot of of power behind it on her on her part yes and in essence she actually kicked you into physical reality you my 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 prenatal self you're saying yes okay yeah okay all right so and and I explained to her on the drive here that determination is very powerful and very wonderful and does not have to be motivated by anger that that you know here here's an opportunity I don't mean to interrupt you and I know it doesn't show in the channel's body but I and several others are laughing very strongly right now because you said you explained it to her in actual fact she explained it to you but it came through your mouth as a reflection of the fact that you realized it was being explained to you and so you explained it back so she could make sure you got it oh so she's like being that reflection until I get it right she's being that as the service not as a dummy yes who's the dummy here and who's the ventriloquist
here's the question about, about shifting this energy now. Oh, I want to tell you a secret now. Okay. You refer to the idea of these monkey puppets that you've hung around your neck. Yes. And using your imagination that they are actually living beings capable of talking. And here is the classic secret of the idea of ventriloquism and a ventriloquist's dummy. In many cases, obviously, those things are actually devices and tools that allow your higher self to say things that you as a person in your reality would never dare to say. Uh, right. But they actually are saying things that often are really coming from not only your higher self, but your guides, yeah. other spirit friends, yeah. and so forth. And they had this cute little face and people would just light up like Yes, a because it comes in a format they can accept because in your terminology, it's non-threatening and they can trust it. Yes. It was because it doesn't have an agenda. Right. Just sharing love. Yes. Just sharing love. Which brings me to, to the question of now this energy that, that has been deeply patterned and, and, and now I'm seeing it, understanding it, and going, okay, I'm... And I'm now you understand that if you're seeing the pattern, you don't have it anymore? I understand that you said that yesterday. I haven't... <laughs> All right. I well, let that be a beginning. Yes, yes. Do you understand the principle? It's similar to the idea of the forest for the trees saying that you have on your planet. For you to actually see the forest, you have to be standing outside of it. Right. Otherwise, you don't see it as a forest. You only see the trees. If you see it as a pattern, you don't have it anymore. You have to be beyond the pattern to recognize it as a pattern. Okay, but here's here's the rub. Oh, the I've rub. All the right. Rub. I've seen it as a pattern for quite some time, but yes. it had not gotten down to this this moment in time yes. where I saw that I could deal with it in this part of that. Yes. In, in a different way. Yes. And All we're right. talking about motivation. Yes. The motivation is my real question because yes. that's, that's even, in a sense, more important is changing the motivation, whether it's yes. from anger motivated. Yes. Here's this, I'm this wonderful spirit, but don't cross me because I'm going to get violently angry if you get in my way. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh, you are so scary. <laughs> And um, it, it's been a pattern that I've struggled with for a long, long time. So it's very That's because you believe it serves you. When you understand that's the motivation for hanging on to it, and you realize that you don't need that to serve you, but that something else can serve you even more strongly, you will change the motivation automatically and let the old idea go. The motivation, the motivation is not the anger. The motivation is what you believe the anger is doing for you. Helping me survive. Yes. Now that you've got a handle on surviving, mm -hmm. you don't need the anger in that sense to allow you to continue to survive. You're beginning to recognize that you need to feed yourself something more nourishing. Absolutely. In order to survive. And now you're starting to recognize what that nourishment is and that it's love and not anger. Right. The right. anger in that sense is your justification for being, and you needed that to justify the idea of maintaining your existence in physical reality. But now, as you say, it's old hat. Mm -hmm. yeah. So now you're recognizing that you're wearing that out and that your motivation needs to be recalibrated. And the motivation then needs to be attached to the idea that something else actually sustains you more fully. Yes. And that is the idea of love. Yes. Self-love, expressions of love, however you wish to phrase it. Creativity, excitement, joy. Absolutely, <clears throat> yes. So you are making that shift. Okay. So then just by reinforcing, then you're saying to, to more and more change that. By the way, it is no accident that you had this revelation while driving your car because it's a sign that you need to shift gears. Right. And and the vehicle of moving yes. forward. Yes, very good. And that if you do shift gears and understand that you're in a different vehicle, then you will be on a freer way to move. <laughs> and there will be no traffic in that sense. Thank you very much. No jam. You understand? Be jelly, but no jam. Yes, I do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now then, let us move forward.
with the discussion and a deeper explanation of the Oversoul idea and the Soul Blueprint idea, as was brought up yesterday of your time with regard to familial relations and how that keys into your Soul Blueprint pattern, you can look at the chart that was created that has the all that is over soul and individual soul and the four quadrants of ideas and themes that make up the concept of your soul blueprint pattern. Now, of course, yesterday we talked about the idea of the pie chart and how all of the different energies that you have brought with you on your journey from different systems, different lives and so forth create this pie chart that has different degrees of different vibrations making it up, even though you all contain the same basic energies, it's in different proportions according to what you are connecting to, what you're focusing on, what serves you best in this particular lifetime. But now, you can also see that what you're bringing to bear, more specifically within all this, are things that have to do with Familial, family, soul group relationships, ideas of so-called agreements that you may be making, in some senses such as we actually just examined, because the idea of the twin, where one dies and one lives, is a perfect representation of a soul agreement within a soul family. The idea being that I will ensure that you will be firmly anchored in this physical reality in the way that will serve you best for the theme that you're going to explore by kicking you into this reality, by moving out of it myself and giving you all the momentum. That's a soul agreement between a soul family group member and another. Many different kinds of agreements are made in this way to be of service and assistance to one another, to provide for the other what the other may need to experience in that life what it is they need to experience so they can best serve out their theme of choice. It is done many different ways, but this is definitely one of the things that is included in the overall patterns, so to speak, of your soul blueprint, are these soul family agreements then they are very personal in that sense, in that you have true familiarity with many of these other souls, individual souls, and have had many different kinds of life experiences, speaking linearly, and have played many different parts, different literal family members sometimes, sometimes being each other's spouses, sometimes being children, brothers, sisters, friends, other relations, mentors, students. You have all at this point, done it all in that context on earth. You've all played all the roles, and now you're playing the role where all the roles come together and are integrated in a manner that allows you to be of best assistance in serving the theme of being on earth in its primary transition phase from one level of reality to another from third density to fourth density transition. That's the general theme you're all playing out, even though obviously you have your own individual themes as part and parcel of helping in the overall transitional theme. Because each and every one of you that becomes more aware of your soul family group agreements, the themes you have chosen to experience in this life, and the more aware you become of how to allow yourself to express those things fully through following your joy and being the fullest self you possibly can be, it adds to the overall momentum and the overall energy of Earth's capability to transition in a positive and harmonious way for those that will ride that wave. So, also you can see in that chart the idea of what might be referred to as random acts. Now, this does not mean accidents. There is no such thing as an accident. But it does mean random act in the sense that you have freedom to choose. There are many probabilities that you could choose from in order to 
decide how to experience your theme at any given moment. And we have used the analogy of walking down a hallway to describe or illustrate the concept of living out a theme. In other words, you may decide that a certain hallway is what you will walk down in life, and that may not change and may seem in some senses like destiny, but it's very loosely described as a theme. But how you walk down that hallway is up to your free will, your freedom to choose. The idea of random probabilities that you could attract to yourself to express the idea of your theme in a number of different kinds of situations and conditions and interactions and relationships. So random acts still plays a very big part in the idea of how you play out your soul blueprint. You leave yourself open, in other words, for the possibility of doing it in any number of different ways. And that allows there to be the variety that is the spice of life, as you say. The acknowledgement of true uniqueness and difference in all of you, in living out your similar themes in a variety, such a variety of different ways that it adds to the complexity and richness of all that is in terms of all the ways it can experience itself going through even one particular kind of transitional theme. So random acts are very important to allow there to be seemingly an open-endedness to the ability and how it is you experience the idea of your soul blueprint. Again, it isn't accidental. No more so than the idea of what you call Let's say gambling on your planet. <clears throat> if you spin a wheel and are looking to place money on a certain number, you understand that the way that the numbers come up may be random, but it's no accident that the wheel is spinning because you spun it. So that's a way to look at the idea of randomness and understand that it has nothing to do with the concept of accident in the sense that these two things really have no connection or have nothing to do with each other. There is no such thing. It's all an orchestration, but the orchestration may be hidden so that you can experience in the act of creation the true moment of creation and the randomness of it, the savoring of the randomness of that true moment of creation. The mechanism of creation itself is brought about by the very concept of randomness. And so you include that also in your soul blueprint, <clears throat> that you can express yourself in any number of ways and still accomplish the same theme. Now, in the family groups and in all the other things that are on that chart, <clears throat> again, it really just has to do with understanding that when you choose to experience physical reality, you do sort of crystallize yourself into a personality construct, and that personality construct acts as a translation device through which... The amalgamation of all of this soul blueprint energy and energy from the source is expressed. And in expressing it through that prism of the personality, the three-sided personality of <clears throat> definitions and the emotions and behavior, in expressing itself through that, it determines exactly what kind of a spectrum in life that you see, what kind of an experience that you have. And this takes us back to the reality generation circuit. <clears throat> so... Again, these charts are designed, all of them are designed as actual meditational tools so that you can focus your consciousness, focus your imagination on the configuration that is outlined in these charts. Not that it needs to be infinitely explained in every detail, but that you yourself using your imagination when you focus on them, when you read them, when you look at their layout, when you look at their configuration, when you look at what the symbols might mean to you in terms of the meaning you have given them, they can, in a sense, be reflections to you, mirrors to you, that will put you in touch with these different aspects of your consciousness, both on the physical personality level, and on the soul blueprint level, and on the oversoul level, and on your connection to source, <clears throat> on whatever level you wish to look at it from, these charts, in a sense, are, shall we say, like unto mandalas, in a way. They are like unto spells, in a way. They are like unto arrangements or patterns or matrices of energy in a way that represent an interface between different levels of you as a person on earth and different levels on which you exist in other realms as well, other dimensions, physical and non-physical. So use them in that way. And let you
your imagination be your guide. This is why they have been created for you as a tool, why they have been designed for you as a tool. Anytime you find yourself feeling a little bit lost, feeling a little bit off your so-called path, use these tools. They're very strong tools. And when you allow yourself to experience them, from that moment of pause, from that moment of neutrality, in that state of being, they will be very strong and effective tools to illuminate in your imagination certain aspects that you need to look at that will be the things you need to process, the things you need to integrate to move even farther forward on your journey of self-integration, of soul growth. Does this make sense to you? One moment. Take a deep breath. And let it out. And take another deep breath. And let it out. And take another deep breath. And let it out. So also then understand that oxygenation of the system is also key. And when you are in that meditative state, the deep rhythmic breathing that is often referred to as yogic breathing is also another way to energize and amplify the vibrational energy within yourself to be more sensitized, to be more attuned to these charts so that when you contemplate them in that state, with the meditational, relaxed, neutral state, with the deep oxygenation of the system, that in that state, you will actually glean more from those charts. Your imagination will open up to more information from those mirrors, from those reflections, from those tools. Anything you can do to balance out your body consciousness, clarify, detoxify your body consciousness will allow you to become more highly attuned and more highly receptive to any information that these tools can help inspire within your imagination. So it is very important, along with any tools that we share with you, that you allow yourself to become the best receiver you possibly can, because it's all about ability to absorb and integrate this information, not just listen to it and let it spin in orbit around your head. Not just allow yourself to be inundated with information, but to truly absorb it. And absorption on all levels is based on the ability to remove toxins, whether they be literal physical toxins or pollutants in your body, or whether they be the idea of toxic beliefs that don't allow you to believe in something you say you prefer to believe in. So the more you can clarify what your beliefs and definitions are, what your motivations are, and the more you can actually detoxify your bodies and your cellular structures, putting into them the oxygen, putting into them the water, putting into them the proper nutrients in a natural way, the more you become highly receptive to all these levels of information that are surrounding you constantly, information constantly coming to you from us, from your guides, from other spirits, from other dimensions, from cross currents and other lives, other experiences you are having right now. Make yourselves more highly receptive by clarifying yourself as best as you can on all levels, <clears throat> on all levels. That would be our strongest suggestion for the most efficacious use of the information we are downloading in this transmission. Because understand that there is much, much more information coming to you all than just what you are hearing coming out of the body sitting in front of you. There is energy patterns, all sorts of things coming to you. Sometimes you recognize this by suddenly finding an increase in synchronicity in your daily lives because you are using the information in a way that you are not really immediately consciously aware of. Sometimes it will be that your dreams will become far more lucid and far more vivid. 
Sometimes it will simply be that you find yourself more capable of taking that pause and reflecting on exactly what is going on and what you are doing and be more transparently aware of yourself. It may manifest in any number of ways, all this extra information that you may not at this point be consciously aware of, but it's there nevertheless, and you can become far more attuned to it with all the clarifying ideas we have just mentioned, both in terms of energy and psychology and emotionality and beliefs and motivation, but also in terms of body as well. <clears throat> because remember, there really is no difference, and the idea really is not that your spirit is in your body, your body is in your spirit in that sense. <clears throat> it's contained within it, supported by it, it's within the soul, within the oversoul. And the idea of leaving your body is not so much leaving your body as it is simply expanding your consciousness beyond that focus. So the body in that sense is really like unto a tube, a spyglass that you are looking through <clears throat> to experience the idea called physical reality. But when you back up in that sense, when you remove your eye from the eyepiece, you recognize that you're holding that telescope in your hand and that there is still a bigger reality in which the telescope exists. And that what you thought was the only reality that you saw through the eyeglass is now just a piece of a bigger reality that you are also contained within. And then when you drop that looking glass, you will recognize that you are also in a bigger reality and another reality and another reality. And as we have said several times, the whole idea of evolution, the whole idea really of spiritual growth fundamentally from the perspective that you are coming from is really the process of actually awakening to the fact that you are the reality you previously thought you existed in. You actually are physical reality. You don't really exist in it. You actually are it. It's an experience in your consciousness. That's all it is. It isn't empirically real. It isn't empirically solid. <clears throat> and even the experience of physical reality itself contains clues that lets you know how ephemeral it is. <clears throat> your own scientists, your own quantum physicists know how unsolid solid reality is. And they even balk at calling atoms solid particles because in reality, they're not. They're just ideas. Wave forms, they may say. But waveform is really just an idea. But your reality is made up of ideas. The ideas you have of yourselves, the ideas you have of others, the ideas you have of reality, it's just ideas. That's all it is. But what a fantastic idea it has been. And now it's going to be a different idea. Just as fantastic, but different. And that's what you're creating now, really, is a new idea of yourself and, therefore, a new idea of what reality experience is all about. <clears throat> Does that make sense to you all? <laughs> what is the time frame remaining for this part of the transmission? All right. <clears throat> Within this remaining time frame for this segment, are there now more questions or discussions with regard to the new diagram, any aspect of it, and anything we have said that requires clarification or further discussion? <clears throat> All right, then abide by whatever procedure you have agreed to. Speak up and be bold so that all may hear what you have to share. I felt driven since the age of 12. Oh, more driving. All right. Surrendered 11 years ago. Yes. Surrender almost daily. Yes. Through meditation. Yes. However, it feels so frustrating because every time I feel closer to the source. Yes. 
it moves further away. Absolutely. Every time. Absolutely. Every How else are you going to grow? That's what I'm coming to. Every time I feel I've learned something, yes. I immediately recognize that I've got so much more to learn. Yes. The more knowingness I have, yes. the more I feel ignorant. Yes. And it is exactly, as an analogy, a magnet game. Yes. The satisfaction of knowingness, the, the satisfaction of enlightenment, yes. lasts for such a small moment. And to be honest with you, Bashar, I'm very jealous. Oh, well, I, well. Want, I want to have you, the answers you have. But I you want, do. I want the knowingness. You do. I want the knowingness. I want you to do. live in knowingness. You do. You do. I know. Nothing is stopping you but your idea about yourself. And the way you think you're going about it or you think you need to go about it. Nothing is stopping you from having the same access to all the same information, the same degree of ideas of knowingness. But I want to let you in on a very little secret. <clears throat> all the knowingness that you ascribe to us from our point of view is barely anything. Most of our knowingness comes from the fact that we know we don't know so very much more. Exactly. Therefore, in the idea that you've already described, you have in fact achieved the same kind of knowingness that we have. But what is the point of playing a game if no one wins? You said earlier on... What is the point of playing the game if no one wins? Yes. <laughs> Why is it not winning enough to just play the game? Why isn't that a win that you are even allowed to play the game? That you even exist to be able to have the experience? Why isn't that enough of a win? <clears throat> Why haven't you already won, in other words? I want to feel <clears throat> winning to the point where the light does not keep moving further and further away. But that will never, never happen. Why? Because it's infinite. How can you have an end to it when it's infinite? There is no end to the game. If you actually want the game to end, the way you experience the idea of the possibility that there's an end to the game is by doing exactly what you have done. In other words, you've chosen to be a part of a physical reality where you could actually forget that the game is infinite. And thus you have made it seemed as if the game could possibly have an end. But now, in playing that game, you have reversed the idea and allowed yourself to begin to remember that the game actually doesn't end. And so the only way for you to once again feel that it could end, that there might be an ending that you would arrive at, thus having won, is to once again forget that there's no such thing as an end. But you don't want to forget that now. You have got yourself completely in the center of the game of paradox. Which game do you really want to play? The one that goes on forever and is always eternally delightful and full of surprises without end? Or the one where you have forgotten and are in the darkness again playing that game? Which do you prefer? The first, of course. Well, then. But it leads me to the next Yes. Challenge. Which is? In context of what you just explained, yes. I can never really assert who I am. Why not? Because I'm, because I'm always changing. Yes, that's who you are. The idea of who you are is just becoming bigger, that's all. It's no longer defined in the limited way it used to be. And that's why you're uncertain of exactly right now who you are. But you'll get it. You'll understand that you're bigger. And that the idea that you're always changing is, in fact, who you are. You are change itself. It's one of the laws of existence. You see, the whole idea, if you wish me to put it in euphemistic terms of something that is, quote-unquote, achievable <clears throat> as a win, is the recognition that ultimately what you actually are is all that is. Now, the paradox is, is that when you fully realize you are all that is, 
it will simultaneously feel like you are moving at infinite speed forever and standing perfectly still. So in that sense, you can find that there is the possibility of creating what you would call a sense of accomplishment, but that doesn't actually mean that anything is really ended. Because there's always something beyond that. Your curiosity will never die. And even if you create for yourself the experience of having won the game, arrived at the end, caught up to the light, you will then at that moment of triumph want something more. And there it will be. Because you are all that is and what you say goes. So it's just a matter of what level of it you want to be aware of for whatever game is more exciting for you to play. For a while, it was exciting to think you could actually catch up to the light and be a winner. Now you're in that transitional stage where you understand that what you really want to do is understand you're already a winner just because you're playing a game that goes on forever. And oh, how exciting that is because the fun will never end. So you're just right now kind of caught between the two ideas. And the fact that you now perceive that everything always changes is exactly the biggest clue that you need to understand who you actually are. You are change itself. All of you, all of us, we are change itself. Because that's the act of creation. And if you want to catch up to the light, recognize that you are the light. And it's always with you. That's when you catch up to it but simultaneously will recognize you can also chase it forever. Remember, in this day and age on your planet, in this process you're going through, the realization that you're ultimately really having is it's no longer this or that, it's this and that. Both are true. What appear to be absolute opposites are both true, as true as anything. That all ideas are true, all perspectives are true, all reality experiences are true because they're all a part of all that is. Experience it however you wish. Does that make sense to you? It does, thank you. Is this helping at all? Very much. Um, small question. Do A anim- small question, all right. Do animals know this better than we do? They don't allow themselves to get so much in their way, yes. They instinctively understand this a little bit more clearly than most humans do. Thank you. Does that help you? Very much, thank you. One moment. One moment. Don't go anywhere. (laughs) What animal do you identify with most strongly if you do? Dogs. Why? They understand us. They have a capacity to love unconditionally. I see. And you think that that's a good lesson to learn, yes? Of course. All right then why not love the game the way it is, unconditionally? Unconditionally. Because true unconditionality does not mean I love it unconditionally except for this one condition. In other words, I have more surrendering to do. You have less conditioning to do. Which might be the same thing. Yes. So take a cue from the dog, so you will make sure you're not barking up the wrong tree. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Bashar. And a you, good day. Thank you. Okay, my question is, you talk about doing. Yes. um, I do, don't I? Yes, you do. And it made me wonder, as an inspiration, like maybe as a model where we're going to, what do you consider doing in your reality? What I understand is is the note like you hang out in your scout craft. uh, Hang out? Yeah, I mean. Like I am right now? Yeah. All right. Do you like, do you spend a lot of time in our terms just hanging out in your scout craft? Well, I suppose you could say in one context, obviously every time there is what you perceive to be a transmission of this nature, I am in repose, in my scout craft. And what were you doing just before that? I was calibrating the electromagnetic field of your planet. (laughs) (laughs) 
Did you spend very long at that? Long is relative. Okay. In your terms, no. Okay. You're not going to tell me much more about what you're doing, I guess. Well, if you ask, I will. Okay. Did you have, did you eat anything today? No, we don't eat anymore. Okay. We have evolved beyond the idea of requiring solid sustenance. We now derive directly from electromagnetic energy within what you call the space-time continuum itself. We eat space-time. But nevertheless, what I get is if you are in your scout craft in what appears to me to be like long linear time, that you're just basically a communicator and interactor with different reality frames. That's my job. Okay. I am, in that sense, a liaison, a go-between, a connector, one who makes first contact with other civilizations. I'm also a pilot, obviously, because I have a craft. And I do many other things in terms of expressions of art and other forms of creativity. But I am primarily, in your terms, a liaison for first contact. I would get, what I'm getting is, is for you to explain to us in linear terms what you do, does it wouldn't totally make sense? Is that true? For instance, for you to suddenly be a creator of art, do you like show up on your planet to do it? I can. Have you? Yes, many times. What have you, what did you make? I have made a large sphere that contains many segments, each of which represents in real time the changing fluctuations of the electromagnetic fields and the collective consciousness of every single world I am having first contact with simultaneously, which at present count is about 27. Okay. And by creating that piece of art, others can actually see a visual representation of the changes in fluctuation and energy between the different worlds as I am communicating with them and how they change based on those communications. They can also sense by deriving directly telepathically from it how those communications change our world as well. So in that sense, it's a functional piece of art. Yeah. Well, did you build it with just intention or with your hands or with machinery? I built it with a seed and intention and energy fields. In other words, on our planet, we have a particular substance that to you would appear to be a crystalline-like substance that is similar to the idea of non-differentiated cells. So in that sense, we can impose upon it a certain intention that will allow the seed to grow into the piece of art using an energy field as its template. By growing on this energy field, which is interdimensional in nature, the piece of art, similar to our spacecraft hulls, can actually be paper thin, but they are relatively undamageable because they grow in the dimensional shape in the shape of the dimension we have created and thus can take no other shape. Nothing can push them out of shape because to push them out of shape would in a sense be like trying to push an entire dimension out of shape. So they take their shape from the template dimension we create through our intention. It draws upon what you would recognize euphemistically as zero point energy in order to do this from the energy that exists in the vacuum fluctuations within space and time. Is this making any sense to you in your language? Yes, it is. Yeah, it also reminded me of like uh, the stem cell research we're doing here. Yes. So we're getting, we're getting that, we're getting towards that state. That is a, an analogy for this concept. Mm -hmm. Because these are not what you would call in that sense organic cells, but they have a similar non-differentiation capacity. They can be made into whatever we wish them to be made into. Okay. The other thing I want to is go go over the creation reality loop that you mentioned before. Yes, the circuit. Yes, the circuit. Uh, We were discussing it last night at some length, and um, at some length, what length? Three feet. (laughs) 
Yes. Oh, all right. <laughs> And what, one of the things that came up was the idea that all those ideas of of going from the, the personality construct to source or all that is and going back from, all yes. those four things could be collapsed into any one act yes. that contains all those things. Yes. Uh, and I'd asked you at, yesterday to give an example. So may I give an example of what I thought? Please. Well, like, say the idea is a person believes that everyone should marry uh, a woman, a man should marry a woman, that's the only source of marriage. And so a, a piece of experience of his would be he's getting married to a woman, that's his belief, he has the emotion of being happy about it, yes. and, and then the action is actually doing it. Yes. And then um, that contains all those elements. Yes. And then using time... Yes. Say later, he runs into, he sees like two men walking hand in hand, and suddenly his belief is challenged. Yes. And he, um, now his belief goes a little bit unbalanced, and he, he, he feels like this negative energy, this negative emotion, because he doesn't believe that should happen. And, All right. And so he is reacting based on his definitions. Right. All right. And so that's just another piece of the, another part of the feedback loop. I, yes. I guess I was just, it, it makes sense to me, and it didn't. It, it, First, so. Oh, all right. Thank you for providing an example that clarified it for you. Okay. Does that help? Very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shark. How's your day going? Perfect. And yours? Not too bad myself. Oh, all right. I have a question for you that I think your response is. Let's, let's say you could give a five-second response to this question. Oh, all right. You mentioned Shall I pull out my stopwatch? Please. You mentioned yesterday that at the height of your communication with our civilization, the emotional state that you were exhibiting yes. was a mere 5% yes. of your ordinary day-to-day -day reaction. In the a, energy level. The energy level. Yes. In a five-second response to this audience... Can you demonstrate by either word or body movement or vibration what your normal day-to-day -day response is on your planet? No. It would harm the channel's body. Okay. The vessel would not be able to handle it. You follow me? Yes, I do. Okay. However, I will be happy to show you if you will meet us in dream time. Because okay. there, the limitations do not exist. You're on. Thank you. Tonight. Let, let's, let's link tonight. We'll, we'll, we'll do it there. All right. I do have a backup question. Just in a case. backup question. Just, just in case. All right. Just in case I was uh, denied this one. Well, you are denied nothing, but... I understand. I understand. Go ahead. On page three of the, of the printout that you provided for us, there's a picture of two triangles. Yes. Triangle one, the top triangle, demonstrates balance and harmony. Yes. With beliefs, emotions, and behavior. Yes. Being in sync. Yes. Triangle two represents a triangle of imbalance and chaos. Yes. Can you give us real life examples of how beliefs, emotions, and thoughts are imbalanced either collectively or individually, like like a an unbalanced belief. Uh, what, what I'm looking at, let's, let's just look at an unbalanced belief. Let's look at that part of the triangle. All right. I'm assuming that the midpoint of that leg represents a balanced belief. Well, generally, yes. Of course, recognize there are many ways to have represented this, and this is a simplistic version for the purpose of illustration. Okay. Well, I guess just explain the triangle. Just explain the unbalanced triangle. Well, the idea would be that if you have a definition that you hold to be true, that somehow your existence is unworthy, then that would represent the idea of being out of alignment or out of balance with your true self. Therefore, by having an unbalanced definition, that will have a tendency to throw everything else out of balance and into chaos as well, because... Behavior comes from emotion, and emotion comes from belief. Okay, so is that implying 
that the imbalanced triangle must start, must start with an unbalanced belief. As far as the personality construct is concerned, generally, yes. It doesn't always have to work that way, but generally it will. Now, the reason it doesn't always work that way is that because in what you call the beginning of the personality construct in time, in other words, when you are a baby, obviously you don't necessarily come in with absolute beliefs and definitions. However, you are then using the idea more of behavior and emotion to sort of feed into your cache of believability, to feed into your depository. And these beliefs are coming telepathically from, most likely, your parents at that point. And so as they feed you food, they also feed you beliefs. And you take on and inherit a lot of their beliefs. And they feed you through behavior in that sense and telepathically and go down through the emotionality and down into your depository in the personality construct and help you build a personality construct out of those beliefs. Then eventually, somewhere between the ages of three and seven on your planet, the belief system then becomes so crystallized that the belief system then takes over from the parents and allows the personality of the child to develop from that point forward from the beliefs through the emotions to the behavior. So it doesn't start that way, but at a very young age, it soon becomes generally locked into that methodology. Does that help? That helps very much. And that's why many times when a person on your planet sometimes finds difficulty in getting in touch with a belief or changing a belief, sometimes it is helpful for them to actually go back to that childlike state where they can truly unlock from it, in a sense, go back to a time before the belief itself was crystallized. So they can, in a sense, melt it down and recrystallize it in a form that works for them now in their new personality construct. Make sense? It does. So a, a newborn up to age three is operating more in the emotional leg of the triangle. Than behaviorally. That's why a baby is all about behavior. And that's what they pick up on, is behavior. Babies are extremely sensitive to body language because that is the first level of where telepathy is unconsciously expressed in a human is through the behavior, through the body language. What you're actually saying, what you're actually believing, what you're actually transmitting to someone, you can see it in the body language and most of you still have that capability if you really pay attention to it. You can tell when someone is shall we say, saying one thing, but meaning another because of their body language, you can pick up on that. In fact, even when you get good enough driving your automobiles, you begin to sense the body language of other cars, and you know exactly when a driver is about to cut you off. You can see the body language translating into the slightest motion of the car, and you knew exactly what they were going to do. So you all still possess that talent. But that is the primary way that a baby has of absorbing information is through the telepathic contact and then through behavior, through body language. Then it starts filtering down in the idea of the emotional energy and it starts resonating on that level. And that resonance starts building, it starts using the fluid part of the personality construct, the part that's still fluid, the believability part, and it starts crystallizing patterns into that fluid which then somewhere, as I said, generally on average between ages three and seven in your reality becomes crystallized enough to actually start generating its own sense of cyclic behavior, its own sense of emotional pattern. And that starts reinforcing the idea of that personality up until the point, generally speaking, when you then psychically key into high psychic sensitivity on your own, which you call puberty. <laughs> and that's why teenagers suddenly rebel. Suddenly all bets are off. Wait a minute. This personality that I've been fed isn't necessarily who I am in my soul. They start to actually make those connections. They have developed the personality to the point where it now suddenly recognizes it has reached a limit. And that limit now requires that it take a leap of faith. And that leap is that they have to really discover who they are. And that means they have to dive back into the soul blueprint, 
back to source and reinvent themselves in the way that is now germane. Now that they have gone beyond survival mode personality level, they now have to go into creative mode personality level to reinvent themselves, regenerate themselves, and be who it is they really are with respect to the themes in the soul blueprint they actually decided to experience in this life. Not that some of them haven't begun to play out before puberty, but now they can really take a handle on their own lives and after puberty reinvent themselves as adults. Now, of course, because of the way Earth, in a sense, has played itself out in some of the limitation games, you don't always give the teenagers the opportunity to really, truly reinvent themselves. Instead, very often, you actually prevent them from doing so by institutionalizing them in formats that do not allow them much creative thought. And that's why you get the idea expressed as rebellion. I, I had a, an extremely rough time period. Yes. In, in, that, in that junior high age, that, yes. that was horrible. Yes. That's because you were not really given all the tools necessary to do the natural thing that needed to be done at that point, which was to truly reinvent yourself. So you did it the best way you could. And many of you are actually still doing it. What actually, and please do not take this the wrong way, it's not a judgment, and don't be down on yourselves and be depressed, please. Many of you are still going through a process of reinvention that actually probably more often than not would normally naturally only take about a year. Nevertheless, you're doing fine. I, I should have bought the manual. <laughs> this now is the manual. Very good. You are co-creating it with us, and that's why we are so excited to be writing this manual together with you. Because now you're really reading it, now you're really applying it, and now you really actually are becoming adults. And... It's probably taken so long to get here that you're probably famished by now. <clears throat> so we would recommend that you might want to refresh yourselves. And after your lunch break, we will resume this connection with some more ideas to help lock these ideas in and propel you on your way. Enjoy your refreshment. We will resume contact momentarily. Thank you, sir. Let us continue with the transmission, with the remainder of whatever follow-up questions may exist on the information we have already discussed. Hello, Mr. Sharp. And are you good day? Uh, yesterday you mentioned there's roughly 200 million oversouls for roughly every, for every six. It roughly. fluctuates. Mm -hmm. And so that rough, works out to roughly 30 souls per oversoul. Yes. And does That's that a typical mean, average? And are those roughly 30 uh, gravitating to each other like the little... Not ones? necessarily. Uh -huh. Depends upon the theme they are exploring, what it is in life they need to experience. Sometimes they will, sometimes they won't. Sometimes they will act like the best of friends, sometimes they will be bitter enemies in your particular reality. Okay. Depends on what they have to reflect to one another or whether they should even interact at all. And is there, uh, so there is, a, there is some kind of a recognition, but it could be... It may not be conscious, conscious, but it will be vibrational in terms of themes that are necessary to reflect to one another to help each other play out what it is you have decided to play out. It may never reach a conscious level. And sometimes it may actually be for the benefit of exploring the theme that it does not reach a conscious level. And do you find in events like this that there is a, kind of a Darwinian uh, a screening process happening so that like-minded, uh, connected souls are often brought together? In other words, is there member, uh, th are there people here who are sitting in the same room with their 20, one of their 29 other uh, people at this moment? A few. Could you share that no. with us? No. Oh. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, well, then that's it. Thank, Thank you. you. Hello, Bashar. And are you a good day? Good day. Thank you. Um, I'm caught in a little bit of a paradox. Oh, all confusion. right. Congratulations. Thank you. And I know you have the information that will bring clarity. <clears throat> maybe, allow me. maybe not. <laughs> um, we never make that assumption, by the way. Okay. We get what we get when we get it. This is true. If we don't get it, we don't need it. I accept that. Thank you. And your paradox? Well, it's between spiritual purity and activity in the world, and it relates... Between spiritual purity and activity in the world. Success in the world, probably. And success in the world. Yeah. Whatever that means. Yes. Um, and also the idea of enlightenment. And I'm wondering if the idea of enlightenment is connection on a multidimensional level to the oversoul, awareness of that. Well, that's one way of looking at it. That doesn't necessarily mean that's what it is, but that's certainly one way of expressing it. I've been expressing it as the idea of dissolving, reliquifying the personality matrix. All right. That's another way of looking at it. These are all descriptions. Descriptions. Yes. Enlightenment is a state of being. A state of being, obviously, of heightened awareness. Now, what that means, and in terms of what methodology you use to represent that particular awareness, that really is up to you and almost doesn't matter. On our planet, we've had, I think, in the, in the history, to get those heightened levels of awareness, we had to retreat and disassociate from activity in the world. From... Some people find that that works for them. Others find just the opposite. They had to dive in more fully in order to actually find their spirituality So and everything in between. So there is no particular path. It's all if about... If there was only one way, there would only be one person. Look <laughs> around. Each person is a path. You're not on a path. You are a path. And if you exist, and if all the other people also exist, then that shows you that all those paths are valid or they wouldn't exist because creation in that sense does not create things which are pointless in creation. Is enlightenment the eventual <clears throat> evolution for each of us if we follow the path Well, of our what do you mean by eventual? <laughs> it may not happen in this lifetime for many people on earth. Right. No, with that understanding, is it, at some point in evolution, over the period of reincarnation or a period of lifetimes, is that... that uh, I understand what yeah. you are saying. And the answer in some senses is yes, but only because everything already exists and therefore on one level you're already enlightened. If you want to look at it as a linear time frame perspective and say that at some point in your evolution will you all reach enlightenment, then yes, because you all already exist there now. So by following the path of my highest excitement and yes. by committing, to, by aligning with my um, soul, soul blueprint, blueprint yes. thank you. You're welcome. Um, then whatever level of evolution I am going to experience in this incarnation will happen. Yes. And there's no reason to think about it other than that. Correct. You will make all of the appointments you intended to make in this life. All of you. You will not miss any of them with one exception. You will only miss your appointment if you are afraid you will miss your appointment. <laughs> so if you stop worrying about missing your appointments, you will make them all. Because you will allow your life to play out in a natural, synchronistic manner. And everything that you really needed to get done in this life will get done. What doesn't get done didn't need to be done. But remember, you are an eternal and infinite spirit. What's your hurry? <laughs> no winning. Just, just enjoying this yes. moment now. Just being. Just living. Just doing what excites you. Just expressing... Who you are as fully as you possibly can. That's all you really need to do. To live a full life and live out any so-called mission, purpose, appointment, or what have you that you intended to experience in this life. That's all you have to do. Do the best you can. Follow your excitement. Be yourself. 
That's all. It's really that simple. It really, really, really is. Okay. Unless, of course, you want to make it more complicated. That's up to you. No, thank you. All right. I, I'll do it. Thank you. And I'd also like to meet on the dream plane. All right. Now, understand, we meet many of you on the dream plane all the time, and a lot of you simply don't remember. Yes. <clears throat> but you can be more open to it, more open to remembering it. Just ask for assistance, and remember that sometimes the ability to remember the encounters you are having in other dimensions and other realities also is intimately connected to your ability to be yourself on Earth as well. The more open you are on Earth, in some ways, the more capable you are of remembering your encounters in other realms. You follow me? The more open... The more you are yourself on Earth, the more capable you are of remembering encounters in other realms off the Earth as well. The more fully present yes, in this yes, moment. Yes. 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 Okay. Does that help? Bashar, I am grateful. Thank you. So are we. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Bashar. And a you good day. And thank you for this interaction. And you as well. Um, yesterday, when we were talking about grays and parahumans, and you parallel mentioned... Parallel humans. Parallel humans. Yes. And you mentioned uh, gray factions. Yes. Which you've mentioned over the years. Yes. And I always thought about it in a very 3D linear way. Oh, all right. No and surprise then, there. Yeah, really. <laughs> exactly. Why, after all these years? But then this morning my brain kind of exploded. Oh. And, yeah, and I thought, wait a minute. Everything's multidimensional. Yes. There's infinite amounts of everything, including planet Earth. Yes. So, so I'm sure very, very many planet Earths had the experience that led to very, very many planets with greys. Yes. And so these factions, perhaps, rather than being this linear projection I had, are from different time streams from different probable Well, Earths. the answer is actually both. Uh-huh. There are different factions because there are different parallel time streams, uh -huh. and there are actually different factions in most of the time streams. Right, yeah. So... That led me to speculation. <laughs> oh, all and right. I know. Is I, that near some other town that we would know of? Yeah, it is. Um, is that like speculation, Nevada? No, it's speculation, <laughs> California. Oh, all right. <laughs> So I'm wondering at this point, I know that you've um, been in touch with other probable Earths that are in the same phase that we're in. Some. And that uh, some of them, I guess, I, I would guess more than one, are going to pull off the transformation and some of them probably aren't. And some of them already have not. And some of them already have. Exactly. And uh, that's exactly what I thought. So since some of them probably already have, yes. and some of them actually already have, yes. where are we at this point? What, relative to all of them? Well, relative to what your interest is in them. <laughs> relative to my interest in them. Yes, like you're, you're tracking us, you're watching us, and, yes. and what we do has directly to do with your existence in the future. So yes. do we pull it off is my question. And can you tell that? Do you think that? I would be speaking with you if you didn't? Well, you've been speaking to us for a long time, and it was up for grabs for a while was my understanding. Not from our perspective. Okay, so it's always been in the bag for us? As far as our reality is concerned, okay. yes. Okay. But you have to understand that the Earth that we were talking to to begin with is not the Earth we're talking to now. Right, and I was thinking about that too. Oh, so you are making a linear connection. Well, in that sense, no. It was up for grabs in terms of the Earth we began speaking with. Right. But in terms of the Earth we are speaking to now, it has always been in the back. Okay. But this Earth changes all the time. Yes. And, I mean... Nevertheless, there's a high degree of momentum toward the bag. Okay. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. And then, you know, I was thinking with the... Um, I was using, like, the, the oversoul situation as an analogy, and I was thinking of fourth density, fifth density, etc. And it seems to me that the that third density would have more finite beings in it because it's it's more dispersed. Would have it's not more as dense. finite expression. Exactly. Yes. So I'm wondering, is your civilization close to where you function as less individuals and more, 
I mean, do you end up being... We are capable of functioning as both simultaneously, uh -huh. individuals and the collective. Okay, and then as we've spoken to you sometimes when you've been non-physical, and yes. from the non-physical perspective, yes. you function as a collective, right? As an individual, because there right. is the capability in certain non-physical levels of still expressing yourself as an individual, even though you may also be an aspect of a collective. Right. So that's kind of like a parallel to Oversoul, right? Well, mechanically speaking, it may function in a similar fashion, uh -huh. yes. Okay. All right. Does that help? Yeah. Thank oh, you very right. much. Thank you. Hello, Bashar. And you, good day. Good day to you. I work with an energy that identifies itself as Emmanuel. Oh, and my, my question is, is that um, on several radio shows, uh, listeners would call in and say that they had profound healings and they were familiar with this energy. Yes. And they would ask me if this was the same Emmanuel that... Uh, a, another person has written about a book called Emmanuel. And, yes. And um, I don't know enough about over souls versus energies that I might be tapping into. Could you give me any clarify? Could you clarify you this You are working for me? with another aspect of the same energy. It isn't therefore exactly the same because it's expressed differently through you and is its own autonomous expression. But it is connected back to the same basic idea that the other ones issue from as well. You might want to refer to it as an oversoul level or something similar as a collective in that sense, expressing different aspects autonomously in different ways through different people at different places and different times. Thank you. Does that help? That does help. All right. So when I was a little girl and um, Emmanuel told me that he was a oversoul of Jesus. Yes. And, and I was raised Jew, uh, Jewish and didn't really have that much of a background of Christianity. Well, that's all right. Jesus was raised Jewish as well. Absolutely. <laughs> it was in 1993. I uh, went to Midnight Mass, and they were singing a song in church to, called Emmanuel. Yes. And I asked a friend of mine um, what, why they were using the word Emmanuel, and she said, well, that's another name for Jesus. Yes. So my question to you is, is this, would this be in alignment with Christ energy? Peripherally, yes. It is not expressed exactly that way, but it is, in that sense, vibrationally in alignment with the oversoul aspect that you also recognize as Christ consciousness or Buddha nature, in that sense, Krishna spirit. It operates on a similar frequency, but it expresses itself slightly differently. Okay, thank you. Does that help you? Yes, it does. So the people that respond to my work... Let's say I get 2,000 emails after one radio show. Yes. Um, the people that respond to my work, are they um, part of the same soul family that feels so comfortable? No, not necessarily. They don't have to be part of the same soul family to be needing to use that particular frequency to accomplish what they need to accomplish in this particular life. Does that make sense to you? Yes. In other words, an artist even though they may buy paint from a particular paint store, doesn't need to be a family member of the people that own the paint store just to use their paint. Right. But their paint may be exactly what the artist needs to make that painting. So they will be attracted to use that paint, even though they may not necessarily be connected to that family that produced the paint any more than simply buying paint from the store that buys paint from the family. Does that make sense? Yes, of course. So it doesn't have to be a family soul connection distinctly in that sense in order for someone to be attracted to a vibration. Okay. This is the same idea also with the concept of relationships where people talk about such things as twin flames and the idea of my soul mate. Anyone that you are in a strong relationship with that is reflecting to you what you need to know about yourself and what you're reflecting to them so they can know about themselves, in that sense, at that moment, that person is your soulmate. Even if in the next moment, you never see each other again. Because the idea is simply about resonance and what you are attracted to for whatever purpose you are attracted to it. And in that moment of attraction and in that moment of reflection, they are exactly who you need to be interacting with or you would not have been attracted to them for whatever reason. It may not be the reason your mind thinks, 
because your mind doesn't always allow itself to operate on the capacity or the level where it recognizes that sometimes things can lure you in certain directions, not because a certain thing needs to come to fruition, but only because you need to move in that direction as part of your path. That's why it is important to not hold too strongly onto the concept of goal orientation. Because the thing that's going on in any interaction is the thing that needs to be focused on, not where you think it will lead, because you often do not know. And often even cannot guess. Does that make sense? Very much so. Does it help round out the concept a little bit? Yes, it does. Thank you. So, thank you. Uh, my question, my this is, a, I think, an important question for me personally. Yes. When I am doing um, this channeling, yes. There are times when the energy is so um, strong, yes. and I wonder, I, I can only assume that it's all perfect and whatever comes through is exactly perfect. Exactly. Even if what comes through is, I don't know, then that's perfect. There are it people... is always perfect for whatever the interaction is. It is always the perfect thing that it is. Not perfect in the sense of being compared to some ideal. It is perfect for whatever it is that's going on because it's a perfect version of that thing and that has value equal to anything else that could have happened. Right. Now it may change, it may grow, it may operate differently from time to time, but whatever it is at that moment, whatever it is delivered, as long as you believe you are doing the best you can to allow it to come through to be of service, then whatever it is for that moment is exactly what it needed to be for you and everyone else involved, whether you know it or not. Does that make sense? Very much so. Does that help? Very much so. Why, thank you. So the, this was a major um, turning point in my healing career. Back in 1993, I had a close friend who tripped over her cat, hit her head, and um, she lost her memory, but at the same time, she also broke her wrist. Don't she was in a lot of pain. So a couple weeks later, she wasn't healing very well. She called me with terrible migraine headaches, and I went to her place. And as we, as I was taking, as Emmanuel says, we're going into frequencies and harmony with who we are as spiritual beings, yes. so we can be, do, and have in life yes. all that makes our heart sing. Yes. And her frequency shifted, and there was a, a very strong energy in the room. And she identified herself as an alien by the name of Julie. And she said that the reason why my friend Anne had hit her head so badly and, went and, and actually had a, a moment of unconsciousness was is that she had a realization about a ship. And they didn't want her, this is what I was told, they didn't want her to um, remember. And so the intention wasn't for her to break her wrist, it was just for her to forget. Well, I got very upset. Why? And I, I told Julie that they had to reverse this immediately. Why? I got upset that she broke her wrist. Why? <laughs> because she was in a lot of pain. Yes. And um, I just asked Julie, I said, would you please reverse this? And she said, yes. All right. She said, in exchange for me teaching them more about compassion. I said, fine. So this is what Julie said. She said she wanted me to just hold the frequency and leave and take a shower for 20 minutes. And I did that and, and agreed. And when, when I came back into the room... Anne no longer had a broken wrist. Her, her yes. fingers were totally normal. All she right. went back to the same orthopedic surgeon. They took her out of the cast. All right, and I understand. And her pain completely went away. Well, at that moment in time, I realized I wasn't doing any of the healing. I was just holding a frequency. Of course. Which has made it much easier for me. No healer does the healing. That's the right. The healer simply gives off the frequency that allows the person, if they are willing to match it, to heal themselves. Okay. That's what a healer does. A healer is a vibrational, resonant example of what frequency the other person can achieve that would allow them to simply allow their own healing to occur. That's how a healer heals, by letting the other heal themselves. Does that help you? Oh, most definitely. Thank you. That is enough. Thank you so much. Are there other clarification questions before we proceed? Yes, for sure. Thank you. And All right, and good day. Thank you for reminding us once again of what we already know. Thank you for allowing me to do so. And it also helps us remember who we are when we do. Thank you. And I also need you to help me re remind me of one other thing. 
And what would that be? Before lunch, you were talking about um, becoming the best receivers we can be. Yes. And removing all toxins. Yes, if possible. Emotional, mental, physical, and spiritual yes. levels. So my question relates to in, in being conscious of the journey, being aware of the pause, yes. yeah, um, responding differently, yes. and going through four months of eating raw foods. Yes. I have for a long time felt that I know the communication is there, and I hope others can relate to this, but I can't find the right radio station. The right radio station meaning what? For um, conscious communication. And there's part of my soul... What makes you think it's supposed to come in the way or the manner that you have been led to believe it must come? Because it comes that way sometimes, but it seems to keep... Then why don't you listen for the other ways that it comes at the other times? And I do. Well? Um, don't you see it? I don't... I feel it more than see it. I see. Do you have no, synchronicity <laughs> in your life? Yes. Well, that's seeing it. Communication from higher levels often manifests itself as the synchronicities that occur in your life. Because that sometimes is an easier way to get the point across, rather than having it be vocalized or auditory or some other way that you expect it should come. Mm. So the idea is that you're constantly receiving it, you're just to some degree invalidating that all the ways you're receiving it are not equally powerful to the one way in which you wish to receive it. Do you follow? I do, and, and I express gratitude in the ways that I do receive it. Um, All right. But there is one of my um, themes is always feeling that I have to be better than I am at that time, which I'm aware of and working on. Oh, all right, thank you. Playing with. All right, thank you. <laughs> journeying with. All right. Um, and? So one of the questions that I've been asking for, I um, part of my excitement yes. is in um, being a channel of frequency and sound yes um in what manner i do singing no it's not melodic it's more electrical toning it comes out more electronic is the only way i can describe but you it. are using your voice i'm opening my mouth and yes. sound is coming out yes <laughs> um all right and it comes out in different levels and people react to it and i just open it up to be whatever it's meant to be all right and for the gathering and but i've been asking for um for what an interpreter chip an interpreter chip <laughs> An interpreter, Chip. Yes. What interpretation do you need other than the response that you are getting from the people exposed to it? Because what I'm getting also is questions of what's happening. Um, and I've been told... Well, they'll find out, won't they? I... What do you want to do? Remove all the surprises from the experience? <laughs> I have to tell you exactly what to expect here. Otherwise, somehow, you're not going to be able to get what you need. That's not the way it's going to work best, necessarily. The idea is to leave some mystery in it so that you give them something to deal with. If you explain every little bit and piece, they will not really learn what they need to learn through their own processes of receiving the toning. Some of it must remain a mystery. Mystery is part of the recipe. It's not a missing piece. Mystery is part of the formula, not a missing piece. That's where your assumptions are throwing you off. Mm. You think that when there's a mystery, that it means there's a gap in information. Right. No. Mystery is part of the mechanism. Why do you think we don't tell you everything? Well, I often get told I'm not allowed to know something. <laughs> there you go. That's why. Mystery is part of the process. Otherwise, no process occurs. And you don't really make it your own. Mystery is what allows you to make it your own, to input your own unique way of interpreting it. Every person is their own interpreter chip. Let them be so. You cannot provide a universal interpreter chip. And don't take away their power by trying to interpret exactly. it. Exactly. Now you understand. So that it's more powerful to let them interpret it themselves. It is. Because then they've made it their own. And it's not yours, right. it's theirs. And that's the only way you can really teach something to someone, is to let them make it their own. They cannot just parrot what you know to be true. They have to find out that it's true for themselves, and only through their own mysterious process will they do so. That's where the phrase in your society comes from, that God works in mysterious ways. Right. 
Listen to another way of phrasing that. God works in mysterious ways. Without the mystery, God doesn't work. Thank you. you and understand? What, yes, no, I do. I do. And one of the senses I got when we were going through the um, so blueprint history, you mentioned that frequency and resonance is the key. Yes. And so I, I, my sensation, my feeling was that there is an opportunity there to use to open and allow source to come through to help people. And that's what you're doing. That is what you are doing. But you have to realize that mystery has its own resonance and that that has to be part of the song. For without mystery, there is no beauty in discovery. All right? Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Yes, thank you, Bashar. And are you a good day? Good day. This is a connection to living in the moment. Um, the human race could be compared to an ant colony that busies itself to the rhythm of time. Oh, why? Time is also a commodity that most of us feel a lack of, thereby impairing our ability to live not only in the moment, but to live in alignment with our spirit. Yes. How can we free ourselves from the strings of time, and could you explain how you live time, or what time represents for you? All right. We are much more fluid and flexible with respect to the concept of time. By living more in the moment, we don't create as much time, because that's actually what you're doing. You're creating time and space. It's not something that exists in that sense without you. The more details you create to work with, the more segregation and separation and compartmentalization you create within your consciousness, the more space and time you have to create in order to have room to have all those details and compartments. But the more holistic and integrated you become, the less time you need to create because you exist more in the now moment. And if you are holistic, then everything that you are fits in that one now moment or more so. So while we have come from an evolution that allows us to understand what the experience of space time is, at this point in our evolution, we don't experience as much of it because we don't create as much of it, because we don't need as much of it. And we don't have the assumptions of time that many of you do in terms of needing more of it to get more done. In fact, we get more done by creating less of it because things occur in the now more instantaneously and don't need time. The point is to understand that everything already exists. So that if you allow it to manifest, then you don't have to create time for it to take to manifest. Does that make sense? In a sense, yes. All right. Would and you suggest that we discard watches and clocks? Some people can find that it would be beneficial if they didn't pay so much attention to that. And focus not so much on time, but timing knowing that if they are really following their joy and being who they are, and they can really get practiced at that and be comfortable living in that now space, then they will be where they need to be when they need to be there, interacting with exactly who they need to interact with in exactly perfect timing without paying attention to any clocks at all. Very often you will find, for example, that when we determine that a time in your terms has been set aside for an interaction with us, we will sense the timing of the end of the interaction, but our timing sense will often coincide precisely to the second to the amount of time that was set aside for the interaction, even though we do not have clocks. So some people have joked that we must be wearing watches because we know exactly when it is, 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock, but we don't. We just know when the timing is done. And it happens to coincide with your time frame because we allow it to find its natural place. So we have no clocks at all. But we are also very used to the idea of trusting our timing, knowing that we can never be early or late, but perfectly on time for whatever it is that happens in our lives. And that we will miss nothing and that nothing will miss us. Does that make sense? Yes. So am I to understand you're suggesting to learn to listen Inward. I am. And to trust and let go. I am. Thank you. 